I'm 21 years old. Um, I've got stage four endometriosis. Um, I've kind of gone through quite a long um, sort of process trying to get diagnosed. Um, my pain and stuff started around about when I was sort of 11 to 12. Um, it's around about 2011 time. Um, and then I wasn't actually diagnosed until 2018. Um, so understandably kind of was quite a long process, um, quite traumatic at points. Um, and I kind of, a lot of it, I thought that I'd, I'd kind of processed and, and dealt with um, kind of sort of a, an understanding of what it is that I had and um, just kind of being sort of told that this is what you've got and these are kind of the options. Um, but kind of the longer that I sort of thought about it, I realised there's quite a lot that I'd been through um, and it wasn't until kind of sort of thinking about that that I realised that perhaps speaking to someone that has got knowledge in the field um, might actually be quite beneficial. Um, so as it was, I got my current consultant to refer me to Marguerite. Um, I've been seeing her roughly now for, I want to say about six months-ish, um, give or take. Um, and sort of beforehand, I was quite apprehensive. Um, sort of therapy and things like that I'd been mentioned in passing um, is sort of consultation meetings and that type of thing. Um, but I always kind of felt, felt that there was quite a sort of a negative around it, um, kind of as a means of sort of this, this was sort of age, but not necessarily in a way that I understood would help. Um, but kind of the more I thought about it, I didn't necessarily think that sort of my pain was psychological, but that kind of talking about it and understanding it and sort of putting that out there might actually help me understand it a bit more and kind of deal with it and process it a lot easier. Um, so I was quite apprehensive beforehand, um, but just the general process of it, um, it felt very comfortable from the offset. I'd sort of seen counsellors and stuff when I was younger and I always felt that there was a sort of judgment in the sessions um, and equally spent a lot of the time kind of explaining what endometriosis was, um, rather than actually kind of having someone that sort of had knowledge on it already. Um, so I felt like a lot of the time the sessions, I didn't necessarily get out of them what I wanted. Um, but with these sessions, I found that just kind of speaking it out loud um, in kind of a way that was quite relaxed, quite impartial. Um, it made me kind of open up my eyes to the fact that sort of speaking, there was a lot more buried under the surface than probably what I realised at the time. Um, Margaret is nodding because I tend to mask a lot of stuff. <laughs> But just kind of speaking, you, you realise that there's a lot more there than initially what I even thought, um, which was quite surprising. Um, but a lot of the process was, I think Margaret will probably explain it, but there's something called EMDR, um, which was the sort of general processing of kind of traumatic events, things that I kind of was, was sort of dwelling on, but, but not quite realising that I was dwelling on. Um, a lot of sort of talking therapy um, and also doing something called a lifeline. Um, so we basically go through Kind of different events that had happened chronologically um i found a lot of kind of my processing was that i'd blocked out certain events that i was quite intrigued by this point to, to sort of kind of see what it was that i was blocking and, and see how i felt about it and kind of just connect the the sort of event with the fact that it's happened to me and and feel okay about the fact that it's happened um so kind of yeah sort of doing the lifeline we kind of put everything in an order um which I found really beneficial um just kind of give it all a bit of context um overall I mean we're still going on with with therapy sessions um as a person I feel like I'm I'm generally quite a lot calmer um I get a lot of pain throughout the month um I'm in pain pretty much every day with my endo um but I find kind of beforehand before I started the therapy that kind of in the build up to particularly my period, I'd be very down, um, just quite nervous, obviously the fact of you, you're sort of aware that this this sort of thing is gonna happen is you're gonna be in quite a lot of pain, quite down. Um, so I kind of felt that by having, we have sessions weekly. So by having that sort of touch base point of call, anything I was thinking or feeling or that perhaps I, I wasn't acknowledging by voicing it out loud, I'd think about it and, and then go into the situation just a lot more calmer um, and just having just a direct, basically someone to, to have a complaint at when you want to have a complaint or just, yeah, someone that, that was there that was impartial, um, I found really, really beneficial. Um, and overall, I just feel like, particularly in, in sort of medical settings, I was still very nervous going to medical settings, I still am, um, but it's kind of given me a confidence in the sense that beforehand if, if sort of different treatments and, and various things would be in front around in conversation I didn't necessarily feel like I had a voice in kind of agreeing or, or saying what 
things I thought might be beneficial for, for me and my condition. Um, that I think a lot of that stemmed from trying to be diagnosed at such a young age. A lot of sort of my conversations had gone through sort of either my parents speaking or, or kind of just having information, sort of here's the information and, and here you go. Um, so kind of by talking about it now, I feel like if something is suggested or if we kind of go through various, I don't know, if, if a consultant brings up a procedure, I feel a lot more confident in being able to say either yes or no or asking questions and, and things that I probably wouldn't have beforehand. Um, equally as well, I find it quite difficult knowing how to speak to people about my condition, um, just in a way that they can understand it as well. Um, friends family that type of thing um and by talking that sort of again sort of built my confidence in in kind of acknowledging what it is that I've got and that it is just a part of me and that's absolutely fine but knowing how to how to kind of put it into words I guess um so I am quite vocal sort of now if sort of anyone asks a question that type of thing um I don't sort of shy away from it as much as I used to um, and equally as well, I'm at uni, I do fine art. So a lot of my sort of paintings, drawings, that type of thing, um, it's all about my condition. So for me, it's it's a kind of way to, to direct all of that energy quite positively. Um, and yeah, just in general, I think I was surprised and I'm still surprised kind of at, at what an impact talking can have. Um, I think it's something we, we do every day. You, you kind of take for granted what it is. Um, but it has such a big impact that overall, I mean, I would say to anyone, and I, I do say to anyone now, even if you think that there's there's nothing you specifically need to talk about, you'd be surprised by what can be uncovered under the surface. Because um, even if it's, it's something that you might think is quite minor, getting it out there does help. Um, so yeah, overall, very, very positive. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, and now we've got Kelly next. Hi, my name's Kelly, I'm 40. Um, I have stage four endometriosis. The first time I was diagnosed was nearly 20 years ago. Um, and again, was a very long process. I've had lots of surgical intervention and I also had a surgery go very wrong where I ended up very unwell um, with, you know, in ICU and all that kind of thing and leading to multiple surgeries and implications for other parts of my body. Um, my last surgery to treat endometriosis was about 2015, 2016 um, and was combined with a colostomy reversal. Um, following this, I developed the symptoms I know all too well. <laughs> Um, they peaked for me in about 2018, which led me to approach my doctor again. Um, everything was delayed because of the pandemic. But in 2020, I was told by my consultant that I was too high risk for surgery. And I was offered a referral to the team psychologist. Um, I didn't know <laughs> that this was an option. It never been offered to me before. Um, I had no real understanding that the hospital had more of a multidisciplinary team now. Um, it wasn't something that was advertised. Um, my experience was always pain, scan, surgery, and the cycle starts again. I'm, I'm, a, I'm disappointed it wasn't offered even during my worst experiences, but, I took up the option. <laughs> um, I've, I've never engaged in these kind of communities before, mostly because I think that I, I just accepted, okay, so this is what's wrong. Let's just get on with life. And what Charlotte said about masking very much resonates with me. Um, I think it was very much a survival tool was to mask and crack on. I was willing to try anything. The idea of living with this pain and nothing happening to impact it wasn't one that I could really deal with. Um, I have accessed some therapies before. I had some CBT before, which helped me with sort of developing tools to manage symptoms. Um, and it was a positive experience. For this, I really didn't know what this was gonna involve, but I kind of felt desperate times call for desperate measures. Um, I had nothing to lose, so I was willing to, to meet with Marguerite. Um, again, we, we started off by talking about my life, my experiences, what led me to where I am today. Um, one thing we also did quite early on was developing a visualization um, that was very personal to me with 
which with practice became a very quick safe space for me. Um, whenever I started to feel high levels of pain, panic, anxiety, stress, it allowed me an initial tool to start using straight away. We did talk about EMDR, um, so we did give it a go. We spoke about the connection between trauma, stress, and how the brain interprets pain. It made so much sense to me. I was willing to go with it. Um, I'll be honest, some of the EMDR sessions, um, there are parts that become a little bit uncomfortable because you're, you're talking about and visualizing past traumas, but it was so well managed. The self-care afterwards was very much encouraged. I felt so supported and I've never had that kind of support in my life before. Um, my biggest challenge quite early on um, was struggling to have a boundary to allow myself to have these sessions, to make myself available because of work pressures, that kind of thing. And my self-care being so low on my list of priorities. Um, we eventually made it work and made it regular. And it's, it's been amazing for me. It really, really has. The sessions so far have allowed me to process my most traumatic memories, the ones that would instantly make me feel like a blubbering, blubbering wreck, the ones that were really loaded with emotion, the ones that I felt like were the most devastating in my life. Um, often these involve being in health settings, feeling intensely out of control, that I couldn't trust the professionals around me, that I was really unsafe. Um, what EMDR has given me now is a lot more distance between the, the trauma then and who I am now, what I am now, what I feel now, what I experience now. Um, a really important thing from our most recent session was that my perspective massively changed. Um, and I do apologize if I'm not great at articulating this because it is very recent. Maybe Margaret would like to comment on this further later on. But for me, it was being able to see people's intention more. The, the trauma I experienced at the time meant that I couldn't see beyond what I was feeling. I was in that bubble. But during the, the session, I had this sudden feeling of perspective hit me so hard. I could see that people were helping me, that they were trying to keep me safe. They were trying to meet my needs. Um, this has made me feel so much stronger and more aware of what's happening around me. And I've actually got a different health procedure coming up, which normally I'd be like, you know, I need Valium for this <laughs> to stop me from going into a full blown panic attack. Um, but I don't need it. I can manage my emotions. I can trust the people I choose to trust. I'm safe. This is a life changing perspective for me. I've had so much success from doing the EMDR with Margaret. Um, since processing these traumas, my abdominal pain has decreased. I don't feel the same stabbing pains or the pulling or the aches where all I, need, I can do is lay down and not move until it stops. I feel a lot more freer in my body than I have in nearly 20 years. Um, there's still little grumbles here and there, but in no way compared to what I was experiencing. Um, and I don't have to rely on those really strong medications to cope with it. I know that people have different ideas about therapy and what they're willing to try. All I can tell you is that this process is becoming life changing for me. Um, it's led to other changes in my life. So to change my job, to reduce stress levels, to socialize more, prioritize self-care and I feel like I accept and value myself more. I can do more and I'm not limited by my pain in the same way I have been for so long. Um, despite the process having periods of feeling very uncomfortable, um, you know, that was then, it's not now. That feeling doesn't last. You're so supported and I just, I can't recommend psychological therapies enough. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Oh, it's amazing just to hear your whole experience. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to start the Q&A um, session with Marguerite. Um, bear with me for a moment. I'm just going to get the questions up. So my first question, Marguerite, and mm -hmm. um, that's been sent in, is can therapy help you come to terms with the endometriosis being with endometriosis being an incurable 
condition causing impact on daily on a daily basis? And if so, how is this approached? Okay, well, I just want to say thank you so much to Charlotte and Kelly for being so eloquent in the way they put um, how psychological therapy has helped them. Um, so I just want to start with just giving a little bit of background about uh, my specialism and the fact that I work with endometriosis sufferers, because it might help. Um, so my answer to the first question is a little longer than my answers to the following questions. So first of all, I just want to say that my specialism is clinical health psychology. And in clinical health psychology, we work holistically by using the biopsychosocial model which allows us to treat the whole person, so mind and body, unlike the medical professions that tend to only focus on the body. So a clinical health psychologist tends to work in hospital and healthcare settings as their work focuses on individuals who are ill, injured, or suffer of a chronic condition. They will help the individual to adjust to the condition, the illness, or the injury, and help them manage and or cope better with the symptoms or the debilitation. So I want to stress therefore that a referral to a psychologist in a health setting does not mean that the referrer believes that it's all in your head, which some of you may think, and which is understandable. So all I'm talking about today um, is mostly um, drawn from the work I've done with so many of women who suffer with endometriosis. So you have taught me so much. Um, so also, I just need to preempt that a lot of what I talk about here is in broad terms. So individual differences do occur, of course, and also uh, therapy is a very individual process, but I'm trying to cover as many bases as I can. So in clinical health psychology, as mentioned, we use this model, this theoretical framework to allow us to form a holistic picture of the person. So it occupies itself with the mind-body connection, which means that we do not see the mind and the body as separate entities, but recognize that the mind and body influence each other and therefore need to be treated as one entity. So from my work with endometriosis sufferers, I have kind of developed a conceptualization based on this model, which I'd like to share here because it kind of answers the question and it also kind of directs you to um, and explains how I might work with endometriosis. So first of all, the biological impact of endometriosis is huge. So you may suffer from chronic or acute pelvic pain, and maybe both. You may suffer from fatigue, have hormonal imbalances. You may um, have sexual and reproductive health problems because of it. There may be painful defecation, menstrual irregularity, and a genetic, genetic sorry, predisposition. Now, I know most of you probably know all this, but it's just important for me to just highlight these things. So the psychological impact of endometriosis is that you may feel depressed, have anxiety, have stress, have worry. And then of course, the social impact is also very big. So you may feel isolated and lonely, you may have financial hardship due to loss of income, loss of education, fear of entering into a romantic relationship. It may affect the relationship with friends and family. Um, and you may not talk about symptoms as you may feel disbelieved, being seen as a burden or in fact weak. So all of these factors combined can have a profound impact on your functioning and emotional well-being. And it is important to add these factors to the conceptualization to recognize the full impact of endometriosis and how psychology may help. So behaviorally, you might start engaging in a boom-bust cycle. You might ignoring your body signals, which is closely related to the boom-bust cycle. And I will explain this later. Um, there may be non-compliance with pain medication as it may cause detrimental side effects which cause more work or school absences. You may need more sleep or rest. You might avoid sexual intimacy. And of course, all of it together will cause a significant emotional distress. So it may be that you feel disbelieved and dismissed, and these can cause feelings of shame, of isolation, 
powerlessness, anger, helplessness due to feelings of powerlessness. You may feel defeated and disappointed, hopelessness and demoralization. You may feel weak and uncertain. You may grieve and have a sense of loss for a life that you feel you can't live and fear of rejection. So of course, this is not an exhaustive list uh, because there are individual differences. So some of you may not feel all of this and others may actually feel more. So this is just to give you some background on to how I might start working with endometriosis. So psychological therapy will allow you to talk about all the ways endometriosis is affecting you. And together with the psychologist, you can look at ways of helping you to cope and manage the condition. I was told by many women that I assessed that this alone is helpful as having someone listening to you and validating their experience is such a potent antidote to the dismissal that many, if not all of you have felt before you were actually diagnosed. So as shown by the endometriosis biopsychosocial model, my work with endometriosis sufferers has made it clear how endometriosis affects all of a woman's life. So the combined impact of this is creating significant emotional distress, which in itself can worsen the pain experience, which I will talk about next. So I do realize that some of what I'm saying here will have answered other questions, but it is important that I fully answer this question first. So psychological therapy should focus on the following areas, which I have detected because of what women brought up consistently as being a challenge. So pain management should be a component of therapy to manage and cope with your pain in a more helpful way. CBT to help with unhelpful thoughts and beliefs about yourself and endometriosis. Mindfulness as a tool to help you cope with the pain and as a relaxation tool. Psychosexual therapy to manage and cope with painful intercourse. And EMDR to help you with trauma and illness beliefs. And finally, I would like to say maybe an element of compassion focused therapy to help you to promote a kinder attitude towards yourself and your body. Because um, I often find that people who are ill or who have chronic conditions can be particularly harsh towards themselves. So as many women have told me, pain is the worst symptom of endometriosis and it causes missed days at school, at work, loss of income, and it may make you miss out on social events. And of course, it totally fatigues you. So as all of you listening will know, is that it is so difficult to, to distract yourself from pain. It's like a magnet, it pulls you in, and this can make you vulnerable to pain-related catastrophic thinking, and unhelpful illness beliefs. So pain is the body's way to protect us from threat, and that is why we take it seriously. However, in chronic pain conditions, this response to pain is not helpful, and you will receive psychoeducation on how to change your relationship and response to pain. So mindfulness meditation and relaxation exercises will be amongst the tools that you will learn, and they will help you to promote an awareness of your thoughts, as you learn to not hook into thoughts whilst you meditate. And it will promote a better connection with your body, which may help you to read your body signals in a much more helpful way. So research and my work with patients in clinical health settings have shown that the experience of pain has a high correlation with depression, as the ability to live a meaningful life is greatly impaired. So pain also causes fatigue, and this again, of course, can cause feelings of low mood. So if pain medication does not work or is causing unwelcome side effects, feelings of hopelessness and powerlessness can be felt too. So in psychologically led pain management, you learn to relate to pain differently. And even though the acute pain experience in endometriosis is so severe that one can faint and strong pain medication is necessary, focusing on separating the emotional suffering and the direct physical experience will help you in making you relate to your pain differently. And as many of you may already know um, and have been diagnosed with IBS, um, a common symptom of IBS is visceral hypersensitivity. So this means that you have a lower threshold for abdominal pain and discomfort 
in response to pressure, stimulation, or distension of the abdomen. So this hypersensitivity will also be reduced once you start to relate to your pain differently and learn pain management tools. So cognitive behavioral therapy will need to be part of the treatment protocol in order to help you cope with the anxiety and depression. And cognitive behavioral therapy is typically looking at the relationship between your thoughts, your feelings and your behavior. And using CBT can make you more aware of your illness beliefs, unhelpful catastrophic predictions about the future, unhelpful thoughts and beliefs about yourself and pain related beliefs. Now, both Charlotte and Kelly have already mentioned EMDR, uh, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And it's a very effective type of therapy when trauma has occurred. So there is a statistic that says that nearly 50% of you, so, and it's to be exact, is 46.8% of endometriosis sufferers have a history of physical or sexual trauma. And so EMDR has a powerful role in helping you process the trauma by consolidating the memory through bilateral stimulation so that the memory does not trigger all kinds of negative emotions and adverse physical sensations. I won't go into detail too much about EMDR here, but you can certainly find more information about it on the internet if you browse EMDR. So it's also important, and I know there's a question later about this, uh, to focus on psychosexual therapy, as many of you experience painful intercourse and may have fears of entering into a romantic relationship as a result. So an emphasis in this work lies on finding a new sexual identity and to depart from a results-oriented sex life to a self-validated intimacy-oriented sex life. So having more positive self-beliefs are a prerequisite for intimacy. So some CBT will be helpful within this domain too. But finally, that will be the last part of answering this question. Compassion-focused therapy can help you to become more compassionate and kind to yourself and to your body, as many people who struggle with ill health are particularly hard on themselves and are unable or unwilling to focus on their body signals and keep pushing on when their bodies are very clearly in distress and need rest. So in pain management, you would be taught about the boom-bust cycle. So the tendency to do too much on days that you feel well, and then to pay for it for days after, possibly being in more pain or needing bed, bed rest to recover. So just remember that the body will hear the way we talk about ourselves. So kind and compassionate self-talk will help the body to do its best to heal and manage. So compassionate focused therapy will help you to practice this. So I hope I have fully answered this question because it's a big question. And I understand that endometriosis has no cure and to accept this is difficult, but psychological therapy will help you to make living with endometriosis less of a battle because that battle is exhausting and endless. Thank you, Marguerite, for such a thorough answer. Uh, <laughs> such a big Offering all bases here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I loved it. Um, it was just so much information. Um, I was taking notes. Um, so my next question is, how can you manage the psychological impact of being ignored um, and dismissed by health professionals? So this is a two-part question, so I can... I can do both. What what do you prefer? Do you want I don't to mind. So, okay. Yeah, you can do both yeah. at the same time. That's and then fine. the next part of the question is when pain starts to reemerge, how does therapy help you go on to seek help without fear of past negative experiences? Yeah. So I know that many of you uh, have been dismissed and uh, disbelieved early on in your journey. Um, and I can imagine that having been dismissed and ignored by health professionals is harmful and damaging to your psychological well-being. So it can make you feel pessimistic about the future and your ability to control it. And some research has even suggested that a pessimistic outlook, especially in early adult life, which is when most of you will have experienced this, that it can cause immunosuppression, suppression, uh, which can lead to lower T4 helper cells and T8 suppressor cells. So cells that are important in the immune reaction or in the immune system to help fight off um, virus, et cetera. 
So those ratios are lower than those with an optimistic thinking style. So it may also stop you from trusting other health professionals and seeking help when you need to, as feelings of shame and anger can be present and act as a barrier to access support or to indeed ask for it. So if this is the case, EMDR can help as it may help you to change the way you relate to these experiences and will make you able to seek help as that cognitive barrier will no longer be there. So it can also lead to feelings of hopelessness and powerlessness, which can be explored in the therapy, so the talking therapy. And I hope that what I've said all makes sense. Um, so my next question is, what is involved in psychological therapy? Is it the same or similar to cognitive behavioral therapy? So there are many different types of psychological therapy. Um, they have different theoretical frameworks and this directs the focus of therapy. Um, as explained earlier, clinical health psychology tends to focus on the biopsychosocial model, which helps the psychologist to conceptualize, i.e. Um, make a case um, of your experience in a holistic way. So in endometriosis, this has highlighted the need for an integrative way of working which I have described um, and that I have started to talk with today. So it has all these different components of therapy to really meet all the needs that I think a lot of endometriosis sufferers need. Um, CBT is just part of this integrative way of working as it focuses on your thoughts and beliefs and it's very effective for mood disorders. So anxiety and depression um, are very much um, helped by using CBT. Um, so CBT is just one way of working psychotherapeutically and has its own theoretical framework. Um, so I hope that answers that question adequately. Yes, and um, so my next question is another two part question. So is there a certain type of counseling slash therapy that should be asked for, for example, CBT counseling or counseling? Um, and the second part is, do you know why consultants do not signpost you to available services at the point of diagnosis? Okay, um, so there are various options you can try to access the right psychological support. So first of all, you should ask if your surgeon or consultant um, have in, within their care provision um, psychological support. Um, if their department doesn't, the hospital itself may have a clinical health psychology department that accepts referrals from all departments and your consultant could refer you there. You may also want to find out if there are psycho psycho psychologically led pain management programs local to you. So your GP may know of these or you might find some information online. Now they tend to work just on pain but it'd still be something very effective, I think, especially if you really suffer from continuous pain. So that is one way or, or something you could do. Um, I know that some trusts run those pain management courses. And I know that, for example, St. Thomas's Hospital in London runs a very good one. So if none of this is available near you, you could go private and find psychologists with an interest in clinical health psychology or women's health on the British Psychological Society's website. It falls under find a psychologist. And you could also self-refer to an NHS talking therapy service if you feel that CBT could be helpful for you. Um, you can find your local service online and usually it is possible to self-refer to these services. So with regards to the second part of the question, um, I had a look at the NICE guidelines for endometriosis and even though it mentions pain management and recommends psychological support, it does not make it a requirement of a gynecological team to provide this. It may be therefore that many consultants will not refer you to psychology, either because they just do not provide it or they don't realize that it may benefit their patients. Um, so endometriosis is really still largely misunderstood, also by GPs, and therefore understanding that sufferers need psychological support in managing this condition is unrecognized, which also stands in the way of a referral to psychology. 
Thank you, Marguerite. And my next question is, has art therapy been explored for people with endometriosis? That's an interesting question. Um, I'm unaware of art therapy for endometriosis, um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, there are, it's, to explain a little bit about art therapy, um, there are three main ways that art therapy is employed, which are based on different psychotherapeutic theories, including psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, and looking at art through the lens of art as therapy. Um, so all incorporate creative methods of expression through visual art and media. So if you're drawn to this way of working, then you should definitely try it as creative therapies, such as art, drama, and music therapy can all greatly enhance creativity. It can help you resolve emotional conflicts and promote self-awareness and personal growth. So if this appeals to you, or you can see particular benefits in it, uh, nothing should stop you from exploring options. I know Charlotte spoke a little bit about it earlier. She uses her art, you know, to express how she feels, and I think feels great benefit from it. Um, so nothing should stop you from, from trying this, this way of working. Um, and I know that some NHS trusts also offer these types of therapy. So it's, it's worth asking. Thank you. And the next question is, can therapy help couples deal with the psychological impact of endometriosis and painful in intercourse? And if so, how? Yes, so couples therapy can certainly be a part of the psychological provision. It can be part or an add-on to the individual uh, psychological provision, or it, be, or it can be separate, whichever is, is easiest. So psychosexual therapy, um, I think, should be part of the treatment, as I mentioned before, um, if the person experienced painful intercourse and if the couple needs support with this. Um, so I think one thing that is really important is that your partner, if you are in a relationship, is educated on endometriosis. Um, one client recently told me that she took her partner to all her medical appointments, which really opened his eyes and made him much more sympathetic and patient with regards to their sex life. If you're not in a relationship, then it may help when you feel it is the right time to give your partner or um, the people that you've seen for a few times, I don't think it's something you necessarily talk about on your first date, uh, but when you think the time is right to give your partner leaflets or direct them to the website of Endo UK, uh, to inform them on it and what it is like to live with endometriosis and how it manifests itself. So I think education is actually key here. Um, you cannot assume that they will automatically understand how it impacts you. So I think it's really important to educate. So I don't know, is that the part, is, have I answered the first part? Um, do you want I'm to just say? So in your answer so <laughs> a i think there's I a really second part of this um yeah i don't know if you've mentioned it emma i think i think so you said can can therapy help couples deal with psycho the psychological impact of endometriosis and painful intercourse and if so how so. yeah and I think I have um, addressed it a little bit. And the second part is, can and how is painful sex and the impact of mental health approached in therapy? Um, I will just come to that then. I will answer that now. Um, so psychosexual therapy uh, will focus on promoting a less results-oriented sex to self-validated intimacy sex, which I've mentioned before. Now, this means that together you work on enjoying the physical intimacy, but to not necessarily wanting an orgasm or penetration. So this may make you feel more relaxed and encourage you in time to try more. It will also look at the role of communication. So how do you communicate your fears and desires to your partner? And I know that because of difficult past experiences, it is difficult to talk about this, but it is an important part of developing a mutually satisfactory sensual, sexual experience. So psychosexual therapy may also have elements of pain management, 
because there is the element of pain, you do suffer pain um, with penetration and CBT. So if the client I work with is single, uh, the work will also focus on the perceived obstacles in entering into a sexual relationship, as many will have had negative previous sexual encounters, which will act as a barrier to enter into a new one, which can cause feelings of rejection and shame, which can be explored and worked through uh, by talking therapy. And this can help to give you more confidence in entering in a new relationship. And this will help you to communicate clearly and openly about what your fears and desires are. So I hope that covers that question adequately. Thank you. Uh, next question is, is there a kind of therapy that can help manage trichlomania? Uh, I think you're missing out one question, Emma. Oh, I'm so sorry. What? What's it's question seven. <laughs> it's about oh, EMDR. Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so is there any evidence or research to suggest that EMDR therapy may be useful in the treatment of physical pain and or the psychological symptoms associated with endometriosis? Yeah. So I, I know that both Kelly and Charlotte have mentioned that I work with EMDR quite a lot. Um, and as I've mentioned before, nearly 50% of endometriosis sufferers actually have experienced physical or sexual trauma. So this statistic alone warrants the use of EMDR. So it's a recognized trauma treatment and it tackles trauma head on, which is not always comfortable, like Kelly was saying. Um, so when trauma occurs, it actually greatly alters the way your mind and body react to threat. And these stress signals can continue long after the trauma is over. And this can affect your mind and body, including the way you think, feel and behave. Now, trauma is a huge area and it is receiving rightfully a lot of attention. But I don't want to spend too much time on it here. Uh, but for anyone who wants to know more about how tra trauma can affect you, you can go to the charity Minds website, that is Mind, and they provide an excellent explanation of trauma and how it can affect you. So EMDR will work on the trauma by, get, by getting you to reprocess the experience. So by bilateral, bilateral stimulation, which is usually through eye movement, you know, I would move my fingers like this and you would follow them with your eyes if we were to see each other face to face. However, most of my work is online at the moment. So then I would ask you to tap on your shoulders, a butterfly hug, or I might ask you to tap your legs. And this stimulates both of your brain's hemispheres. Um, so the memory is stored in, um, when you are traumatized, the memory is often stored in several uh, parts of the brain and by the bilateral stimulation and other instructions that I will give you, it is then stored in one place. And so the memory becomes consolidated and that way it holds less heat and is less triggering for you. So you will be able to talk about the memory without feeling the associated negative emotions and physical sensations. And you will be able to regard it as just a memory Many of you will also have experienced surgical traumas like Kelly spoke about, and EMDR can help very well with this. It is important that trauma is addressed in psychological therapy for, for endometriosis, as trauma makes you also less able to tolerate pain as it lowers your threshold to pain. So it's really, really important. Thank you, Marguerite. And, um... The next question is, is there a kind of therapy that can help manage trichlomania? Yeah, trichotillomania is known as a hair pulling disorder. Um, so the cause is not entirely clear, but it can be one's way of dealing with stress or anxiety. Uh, it can, however, also be a chemical imbalance in the brain, similar to obsessive compulsive disorder, or it is due to changes in hormonal levels during puberty. So it's typically treated by using cognitive behavioral therapy, as it will focus on giving you particular homework tasks, such as keeping a hair pulling diary, identifying triggers for hair pulling, 
and how to avoid the triggers and delay the urge to pull. So I can imagine that as endometriosis is such a difficult condition to manage and to live with, that stress levels can cause you to pull your hair as a coping mechanism because relief is found once the hair is pulled. Um, it's also possible that your hormone levels are changing, causing you to want to pull your hair. Um, and typically the NHS talking therapy services, I've mentioned them before here, will offer CBT and will be able to help you with this. And you can self-refer usually to those services. Thank you, Marguerite. Um, my next question is, what therapy can help manage psychiatric diagnosis aggravated by hormones? Yeah, this is actually a difficult question for me to answer, I have to be honest, as I actually don't know enough. But I would say that my first inclination would be to say that everything that I've mentioned before today, uh, especially at the beginning of my talk about you know, how I work with women with endometriosis, that it should all apply to the person who've asked this question as well. It does, however, very much depend on which psychiatric diagnosis we are talking about and whether you are taking medication for this. Um, from the way the question is asked, I, it sounds like this person is feeling that their hormones are having a negative impact on their mental health diagnosis. And if this is the case, then your psychiatrist should, you know, he or she prescribe the medication, they should be able to answer this question for you. So if you are under a mental health multidisciplinary team, for example, then perhaps you can discuss it with them too. Um, I wouldn't necessarily ask a GP this because they're not mental health specialists. Um, so I would say it's better to have this looked into by a psychiatrist. Um, and that's really all I can say about this. Um, so I'm sorry, I cannot answer the question better, but if you are at all concerned and are noticing a notable difference, then please do flag this up with a health professional. Thank you. So what are the early signs that would indicate that psychological support would be beneficial and even preventative to destructive psychological distress? Um, yeah, so from experience in working with endometriosis sufferers, I would say that being dismissed by a GP or other health professional at the age of 15, maybe slightly younger or older, um, can have a profound impact on your attitude towards asking or seeking help, as you don't trust medical professionals anymore, but you may also not trust yourself anymore. So if you are repeatedly dismissed, which I know is the case for many of you here, you may also start to doubt yourself and start judging yourself for being weak or believe that there is something wrong with you as no one can find anything seriously wrong with you. Um, so those experiences can have an immediate detrimental effect on your emotional and psychological well-being. It can also make you feel hopeless about the future and can promote uh, I have to just get on with it attitude, which isn't as helpful as explained before when I spoke of unhelpful behavioral responses to pain and debilitation. However, these experiences <clears throat> can have a more detrimental <clears throat> effect on those that lack social support and who have had adverse experiences during childhood, which can make you more vulnerable to psychological distress. <clears throat> so I would say that psychological support early on would be helpful and I would love for everyone who gets, um, you know, who has the first symptoms to get psychological support, um, but not just for psychotherapy, um, which will promote a different perspective on your experiences, but also to give you education and tools to cope and manage endometriosis from an early age. Thank you, Marguerite. And my next question is, how does psychological therapy manage your mood changes? Can it make you feel less alone? Yeah, I think I have answered this question partially already by talking about what elements psychological therapy should have in order to help in a holistic way um, by talking about the model, the biopsychosocial model. I would like to add here, however, that just being able to talk freely on a safe platform with a therapist, psychologist, will make you feel less alone 
as it is a non-judgmental, neutral place where you are invited to talk about your experience openly and honestly. So illness typically can make people feel isolated and especially as endometriosis is so misunderstood, it is more likely to cause feelings of isolation and loneliness. Um, there are now many platforms that will allow you to reach out to others with endometriosis. And I think um, Endometriosis UK runs local groups as well. So you could check that out. Um, there's also Nancy's Nook, um, you may have heard of it on Facebook, and uh, endometriosis sufferers and even their surgeons post their experiences. And so it can also be of an informative educational use. I do think that sharing experiences is probably the most effective tool in combating loneliness. So my invitation to the person who asked this question is to seek out endometriosis support groups and start sharing your experience as it will help you. Thank you, Marguerite. And yes, you're right. We do have support groups um, available and you can find this on the services section of our website. Good. Um, so the next question is, is therapy for friends and family of endometriosis suffer something you are familiar with? I'm actually not familiar um, with therapy for friends and family of endometriosis sufferers, unfortunately. Again, I would think, however, that education about how endometriosis affects women is of great importance, as that will create more understanding and empathy. So creating support groups for friends and family who live with an endometriosis sufferer could be helpful, but I would say that there might also be a risk that the endometriosis sufferer in question will feel perhaps responsible for the negative impact their condition has on the family and friends. And this may contribute and heighten the feelings of being a burden on them, which I feel is not helpful as it will add to the already present feelings of guilt and responsibility. So I would say that should friends and family therefore feel they need support, maybe you can talk about it. You can check with them what exactly it is they are struggling with and see whether this can be resolved by giving them the education on endo. And if you feel able to have an open and honest conversation with, with them um, and you know about how endo may have an impact on them, which may resolve some assumptions they have and judgments you have which can go either way for you and them. And if they still feel they need further support, perhaps they can find a therapist to talk to on an individual basis. Um, but perhaps, um, Emma, you know more about initiatives that Endo UK may have with regards to this subject. I'm not entirely sure if there are any initiatives uh, in that direction. So on the support groups, you can, um family and friends can attend. So you would just need to um, check with the group leader. Um, if they're opening the groups up to family and friends, they might have um, different agendas for each, each meeting. And also family and friends can also use our helpline as well. Um, and then they can also use our online forum. So all of those services are available on our website. So I would, wh whoever asked that question, I would direct them to there. Okay, so, thanks. My next question is, if you are stressed by the pros and cons of surgery, can therapy help manage this? Yes, this is a short answer. Um, I had a client who was exactly in that position because she had experienced surgical trauma, um, endo tra endosurgery, I should say here, which made considering further surgery too overwhelming for her. Um, and we resolved this by using EMDR and of course also talking about it. And this allowed her to develop a different perspective as she felt a lot of worry and anxiety had been resolved by reprocessing the trauma. So as a result, she was able to make a better informed decision by entering into a helpful dialogue with her surgeons. And that was something that she felt too scary and it was too overwhelming for her before we started working on her trauma. Now, of course, I don't know whether the person who asked this question has experienced surgical or other trauma, so this may not answer your question fully. Um, the fact that you mentioned the word stress, however, may indicate that you have, but if you haven't, learning about coping mechanisms such as relaxation techniques and breathing techniques may help you if you feel any anxiety or worry about surgery. 
And any un unhelpful thoughts can be addressed and changed into more helpful ones by using CBT. And problem solving can also be a component of psychological therapy. Um, and that discussing options with your psychologist and therapist will help you to make a decision. So I know that endometriosis surgery is high risk and that it is actually wise to think about it carefully and to weigh up the pros and cons carefully. And I would hope that the medical team will assist you in this by offering you all the information you need. And if they don't, you should definitely demand this from them. Thank you. And for my last question is, how does therapy separate, how does therapy help you separate yourself from endometriosis and not be the focus on, of your thoughts? Um, so it's common for people who are suffering of illness or chronic conditions to consider the illness or condition as their defining feature. So in other words, it's their entire identity. It's who you are. Um, I can imagine that in endo, as it affects so many domains in your lives, that this can easily happen. So the good news is that psychological therapy can help you separate yourself from the endo endometriosis. And this will be through um, being taught about CBT, about mindfulness and pain management, uh, tools and exercises that will help you cope and manage better with endometriosis. And when you feel as a result of managing it better, having more control over it um, and feel less debilitated by it, you will feel that a separation will naturally occur. So the endo isn't in control anymore. It is something that you have learned to live with, but you are not battling with anymore. And if this is a continuous battle that causes many unhelpful thoughts, feelings, and beliefs, which will influence the way you cope and manage the endometriosis, which therapy uh, will address. Um, and as I said before, uh, this continuous battle often manifests itself in um, not listening to your body signals, um, pushing through, having that attitude for just getting on with it, um, which is not always the best thing. So finally, I just want to say that anyone who's attending this webinar and who's currently feeling like this, that they all need to remember that you are not your endometriosis. You are also a partner, a friend, a daughter, a mother, a lover, an employee, a colleague, and many other things too. Uh, you may be a great cook, athlete, writer, or artist. So remember, you are not just endometriosis, even though it may feel that way.